So the following questions I'm going to read to you were answers that were actually said in court. The court reporters who typed these questions and answers word for word published them in a book called Disorder in the American Courts. And so first one, the attorney asked this question, do you recall the time you examined the body? The question was asked to a medical examiner. The witness said the autopsy started around 8.30 p.m. Attorney, and Mr. Denton was dead at the time. <laughs> weird? Witness, if not, he was by the time I finished. <laughs> Next one. Attorney, doctor, how many of your autopsies have you performed on dead people? It's an actual question. Uh, witness, uh, all of them. The live ones tend to put up too much of a fight. <laughs> Last one. Um, attorney, doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? Witness, no. Attorney, did you check for blood pressure? Witness, no. Did you check for breathing? The witness says, no. Attorney, did you check for breathing? Witness says, no. So then is it possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? Witness says, no. Attorney says, how can you be so sure, doctor? The witness says, because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar. <laughs> okay. Well, there's more. <laughs> Attorney, oh, I see. But could the patient have still been alive? And so the witness says, yes, it is possible that he could have been alive and practicing law. Now, in all these accounts, they're not always a lawyer um, speaking to a physician, but in all the accounts in the book, um, it is a lawyer asking really dumb questions. And the lawyer looks really bad in every one of these, these stories. I think it's important for us uh, to remember this, that when it comes to court cases in the scripture, um, in most cases that we see, God is the judge, we are the defendant. Satan is the prosecuting attorney. But just like in any field, there are those that are good and bad. And of course, Satan is the prosecutor who's not fair and not just. And of course, he has evil intent. And Jesus is the advocate. Jesus is our defense attorney. And he's the one who argues on our behalf that we are in fact justified. That is, we are right with God. So that the things that are against us, all, all the, the handwriting of the requirement, as the scripture puts it, all the ways that we have failed to do what's right, the ways that we have done wrong things, all those things that are true, he has dealt with. And so he argues that he has paid for all those things. And that is what causes us to be saved. And so again, like the scripture says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we need to address something that's really important when it comes to this idea of salvation because when we talk about salvation, the idea of faith and works comes up. So would you turn your Bibles over to James chapter two, James chapter two. And we're going to be looking at James uh, chapter 2, verse 14 and following. While you turn there, let me just illustrate that when it comes to the issue of faith and works, both are necessary. Just like we see in, in many ways in life as we deal with life issues on a daily basis. For example, sodium and chlorine are deadly chemicals. So if you were to ingest either one of those individually, either sodium or chlorine, you would die. But if we combine both of those properly, we have sodium chloride. And sodium chloride is table salt. So the same thing that is deadly, in fact, is a poison separate. If you have these two things separate, when you combine them in the proper way, not only is it safe, it's actually helpful. It's useful. It's, in fact, something your body even needs. The same thing is true when it comes to faith and works. Faith and works are inseparable. We need both of those together, and we need to understand how that works. James chapter 2, verse 14, it says this, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Verse 15, 
gives us an illustration. If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? The idea is this. If you say to a person who's in need, depart in peace, be warmed, be filled, are they magically warmed because you said so? I mean, are, are they full? Is their stomach full because you said be full? Well, of course not. There has to be something else that happens. Something needs to take place. And so it goes on, and notice what it says. If one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed, and be filled, but do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Meaning this, it's useless. So we need, of course, to have the faith and we need to have the works. James goes on to give two more illustrations as he talks about Abraham believing. He demonstrated, though, that he believed by what he did. And of course, Rahab having faith, she believed, but she demonstrated that she believed by what she did. And so the idea is this, again, very clearly, that faith without works is dead. The idea is, is that if we have only faith, but there is no works, then it would be like being inside of a boat and having an oar that said faith. And another one that says works, but you have the one that says works inside the boat, and you simply row with one oar. You'll just go around in circles. Or if you have the oar that says works, in the water and the one that says faith in the boat and you just only use works, then again, you go around in circles. That's religion. Religion will not save us. But having nice sentiment, having good thoughts, knowing the right things or even believing doesn't by itself save us. And that's why the scripture goes on in James chapter two to say the demons believe and they tremble. Implying this, we need to be saved, of course, by grace through faith, but we need to understand real faith, genuine faith, so that we are believing with what's called saving faith, because saving faith, in fact, works. Simply put, true faith works, and it works unto salvation. Now, for many of us, as we've talked about this type of issue in church, You've probably heard a lot of different answers to the problem, whether it's faith or works. It's not either or, it's both and. The idea is the order. So in other words, you believe, and when you really have believed, of course, you're going to demonstrate that you truly believed by having works. So where there's true faith, works will exist. And that makes sense. And we can, of course, wrap our brains around that by using marriage as an example. You know, Jack and Jill fall in love. They get married. They stand up in front of their family and friends. And both of them confess their love for each other. They both make a commitment. They both say their vows. But those vows in and of themselves don't mean anything if they don't also live them out. And so if they truly love each other, they're not just going to say they love each other. They're going to show that they love each other. If they're truly committed to each other, they're going to be committed. And so there's forensically or spoken out a truth, but then, of course, the actions follow. This is saving faith or active faith. And this is true when it comes to salvation. A person who responds to an altar call when somebody gives a gospel message and says, well, stand up if you're ready to give your life to Jesus Christ. Stand up if you believe on Jesus or raise your hand if you believe and you want to be saved. The standing up or the raising of the hand or even the coming forward to the altar doesn't in and of itself save them. But a saving faith will be something that is spoken or declared. And then, of course, there's evidence that shows the person actually did believe. And so we get that, I think, that idea that true faith, of course, will have evidence. True faith will demonstrate in some way, shape, or form that it was sincere. But I think there's something else that we need to remember. Maybe people struggle with this idea of faith and works in part because they forget, listen, faith is always our part. And works are always God's part. And when there is genuine faith, listen, God works. 
He will work on your life. He'll work for you. He'll work in you. And he'll work through you. It'll happen. Where there's genuine faith. And you see it all throughout the Old Testament. And you see it in the New Testament as well. And so faith works. There are three ways God works on behalf of those who believe. In verse 8 and 9, we see justification. In verse 10, we see sanctification. And then we also know throughout the New Testament that he does this thing called glorification. And we'll talk about that also this morning. Notice verse 8, justification. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now turn your Bibles, please, over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Notice what Jesus says on this topic, because, of course, he's the authority when it comes to this issue. Notice uh, John chapter 6, as we're looking here in verse 29. Jesus was asked the question, um, what do I do to work the works of God? In other words, what do I do to go to heaven? How can I be saved? How do I do what God wants me to do? Notice John 6, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Notice it does not say that you believe and then also get to work. It says simply that you believe. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And so God does his job. For us, that's grace as he does the work and we believe upon him. And so by grace, we've been saved through faith. Now, just to illustrate this point, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, we saw as we were studying in chapter 1, the work of the Father for our salvation. That's in verses 3 through 6. Then we saw the work of the Son for our salvation. That's in verses 7 through 12. And then we see the work of the Holy Spirit for our salvation. And that's in verses 13 and 14. But notice this, in John 5, verse 17, Jesus is speaking, and he says this, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Again, that's John 5, verse 17. My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. What it's referring to is the Father and the Son have been working before you were born, before any of us existed. The Father and the Son were working everything that needed to be done in the creation, and then, of course, in the recreation, that is, us being saved, us being drawn to God. The Father has been working, and the Son has been working. So everything necessary that needed to be done for our salvation was done by God. The Father has been working. The Son has been working. Titus 3, verse 4, goes on to say, But when the kindness and the love of God our our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, So not according to works, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Father has been working. The Son has been working. The Holy Spirit has been working. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all working for our salvation. All the things necessary that needed to be done have been done by God. Listen. And now he works on us. And so this idea of justification, that is us being made right with God, fancy theological term, it's just as though when God justifies us that none of the things we did happened. Meaning it's just as though we'd never sinned. He has dealt with our sin, past, present, and future. Everything has been paid for on the cross at Calvary by the power of his blood and through the power of the resurrection. Amen? Amen? So he's done everything necessary for you and I to be justified with God. So that all over our lives, if there was a court case, it would say not guilty. Because he who knew no sin, that is Jesus, became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So if we don't know God yet this morning, we come to him with a life that is soiled by sin, a life that's messed up because of our own choosing, and we bring it to God and we say, Can you do something with it? 
Here it is. We give our life to him and he gives us his life. We give him our sin and he gives us his righteousness. It's what C.S. Lewis called the great exchange. And so that great exchange is made as we give our life to him, including our sin, and he gives us his righteousness. So he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. What that means for anybody who believes in Jesus Christ today, it means that when God the Father looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which means we have every right to get in to heaven. He's drawing us to himself. Turn your Bibles over to John chapter 6. Notice something that's really important because when we talk about the the work of God drawing us to Jesus Christ, oftentimes people will reference the Holy Spirit, but they won't reference the scripture. So they'll say the Holy Spirit is the one who draws people to Jesus Christ. But I want to point out something to you because we've already talked about this when it comes to Ephesians that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Godhead, are working for our salvation. They've done everything necessary for us to be saved. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I just read to you John 6, 44, or I'm sorry, uh, John 6, or 5, 17, and Titus 3, 4, which talks about the Father and the Son working, but also the Holy Spirit working. But notice this passage here in John 6, verse 44, because in John 6, verse 44, Jesus is speaking, and he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Don't miss that. Let that soak in. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father who sent me draws him, he says. So God the Father is involved in the whole process of drawing a heart to Jesus Christ. God the Father. This verse oftentimes is quoted to say the Holy Spirit is the one that's drawing us to Jesus. But that's not at all what it says. God the Father himself loves you. And God is not willing that any should perish, but desire all to come to repentance. And remember, as the scripture says, he's not slack as we count slackness, meaning he doesn't say he's going to do something and then not do it. He's not delaying because he just wants to delay because he's a procrastinator. God is not bringing the end to all things because he's long suffering. He's waiting for people to come to repentance. He's longing for people to come to repentance. And according to this passage here, he draws people to Jesus Christ, which means he compels them. This word draw is a really powerful word. He compels them. He's trying to capture them. He's wooing them to himself. And so God the Father does that. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Notice John 12. John chapter 12. Jesus is speaking here about himself And in John 12, verse 32, notice what he says on the same issue. It says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. So what he's saying is, if I be lifted up, speaking about the crucifixion, if I be lifted up, I will draw all peoples to myself. This is a reference to what he said in John 3, likening himself unto the serpent in the wilderness, That when the people were bitten by snakes, and of course they were dying, anyone who looked at the bronze serpent was healed. It's also a reference to the book of Isaiah, where God is speaking. He says, look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, look unto me and be saved. And so us looking unto Jesus, what does that mean? It means believing that those who believe upon the Lord, he'll no way cast out. Those who call on the Lord will not be put to shame. But those who are crying out for help, he'll save them. Just like we talked about last week when it came to Peter walking on water and, of course, sinking, and he cries out, Lord, save me. He saves him, just like that. The same idea when it comes to salvation for you and me. We call upon the Lord, and he'll save us. And we do that, of course, by faith. So in John 6, verse 44, the Father is drawing people to Jesus. In John 12, verse 32, Jesus is drawing people to himself. Don't miss this. John 15. Turn to John 15, please. John 15. We're looking at verse 26. Remember, as we talked about in Ephesians chapter 1, we saw it three different times. That the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working for our salvation 
Remember, according to the good pleasure of his will, according to the good pleasure of his will, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. Meaning God is known to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. First John tells us, chapter 5, verse 7, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. And remember, it's in Deuteronomy 6, 4, where it says for us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord is one. In Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohenu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is three. The Lord is one. You say, well, I don't understand it. I don't get it. You don't have to. You just need to believe. And when it comes to this issue, if we could explain everything that could be explained about God, then he certainly wouldn't be big enough for us to worship. But he is the one who is more than able. He is the one who's capable. He's the only one who's God. He is great and he is good. And so let God be God. And I simply have to believe upon him, knowing that he's more than able to handle any problem that I deal with, especially from the very beginning when it came to sin and death and every day afterwards. And so the father draws people to Jesus. The son draws people to himself. John 15, verse 26. Notice the second half of the verse. Jesus is speaking and says, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. This idea is he will declare who I am. In other words, he will magnify me. In other words, he will draw people to myself. The father draws us to Jesus. The son draws us to himself and the spirit draws us to Jesus. And this happens, of course, as God is working on us. God was working on me. I was eight years old and I came in contact with the first Christian that I'd ever met. He was eight years old. We were on a playground messing around and he was a big kid, head and shoulders taller than me and any other eight-year-old I knew. And a couple other kids who clearly knew who he was began to harass him. They began to pick on him. They started by calling him names. They eventually graduated to spitting on his head, on his face, and then they started pushing him. He didn't push back. He didn't defend himself. He just took it. And I was just blown away. I'd never met him before, but I thought, wow, I mean, why is he doing that? We eventually all found our way back to where our parents were, and I'll never forget as I was walking back to where my parents were, which were happening right next to where his parents were, his mom saw him trying to clean up the spit off his face, had seen the whole thing take place at the playground, and she complained to one of her friends, and she said, ever since he became a Jesus freak, he's been like this. He won't defend himself. And I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. That's different. I'd never see anything like that. My heart wasn't pricked beyond that moment. I wasn't interested, didn't really understand. When I was 10, I received a small Bible. It was a gift. Still have it, tiny little Bible. Had the gospel message in the front cover and a little place where you could sign your name. So if you prayed the prayer that was listed right there, you could sign your name to declare that you had dedicated your life to Jesus Christ. Now, I've read that now, knowing what it said, but back then, I didn't understand it. I know I didn't read it. I just saw a place to sign my name, so I signed my name. That was all. Didn't go deeper than that. I signed Joe Kevin McCormick, a nice Mexican name, I know. <laughs> Don't give me a hard time. It's my name. I'm stuck with it. Yeah. Didn't think much about it after I signed it. Found it several years ago. Noticed I signed it, but I know I wasn't saved back then. My heart wasn't ready. At 13, I was in school um, in an environment that was a, a private school, but there was a Christian influence. And the person that was leading our music program was a former nun. She had left the, the nunnery and had become a music teacher at a private school and used to teach us worship songs. She apparently was hanging out a lot at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and she was bringing to us the songs of Maranatha praise and so forth. And that was my first introduction to Jesus music. 
trying to motivate us one time. We were all sitting there in music class, and she had us looking up at the crucifix on the wall, big, giant crucifix. And she said, look at Jesus while you sing this song. And so every one of us, all of us, a whole class of you know, some 30 kids, you know, couldn't look at Jesus as we were singing the song. All of us said the same thing. We, it was like Jesus was, was writhing on the cross. He was moving. All of us saw it. Right? And so somebody said, you know, I can't look at him, you know. It's like he's moving. So she looked at us and yelled at us, and she said, how wicked are you that you can't look at Jesus on the cross? And I thought, well, she has no idea how wicked we are. We are a wicked group, right? <laughs> I remember thinking, she's not supposed to yell at us, is she? You know? And then I realized, yeah, she left the nunnery, and she just became a normal person, and that's why she's yelling at us. <laughs> I didn't think much beyond that when I left that day. My heart wasn't ready. At 14, I heard Billy Graham speak in person at the Anaheim Stadium. It was the last time he spoke in California in 1985. Last time he spoke at Anaheim, I should say. I'm sure he gave a great gospel message. I don't remember it. I was with a whole group of people. Everybody stood up at the altar call, but me. I was unmoved. We got in the car and they were talking about it all the way home and I was just as unmoved as I was when I was hearing him speak. Didn't think much about it. When I was 17, I was walking in the mall with my girlfriend, Vicki, who later became my wife. And a young man came up to me and he shared the gospel. I was angry as soon as I heard it. I objected, I tried to you know, say something to contend with him. It didn't make any sense. I knew it didn't make any sense. He knew it didn't make any sense. He was gracious, still gave me an opportunity, still encouraged me, but my heart was hard. Definitely not ready. It wasn't until I was 19 years old, as I was reading the Bible that was given to me by Vicki, not reading it because I was interested in God. I was reading it because I was interested in her. And I read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I knew I was a bigger creep than I thought I was. I got to Acts, which was pretty much kind of a blur, but I was more convinced of how much of a creep I was. Got into Romans, read Romans 1 and 2 and 3, and was convinced I was doomed to hell. Read chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, and I was more than convinced I was overwhelmed that I was headed to hell. I was depressed all the way through chapters 8 and 9, in the first part of chapter 10. And then I got to those words in Romans chapter 10, verse nine, that says, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And somehow I knew this was my opportunity. This was my chance. And I cried out in an empty church, I believe. And God got a hold of my heart and he gave me something I'd never had before. He gave me peace. He came into my life, he made me a new creation, and things started to change. The works just came, and I wasn't trying to do them, I simply was believing. And as I was believing, it just happened. The best way for me to describe that, if that doesn't make sense, that we express faith and then the works just come is just to say, you say yes to God. And if you get in the habit of saying yes to God, then it just happens. Things just flow. The same way of what happens in a marriage when two people fall in love and make that decision before a whole group of people to declare their love and their commitment, their vow before each other, that if they stay in that place where they were captured by love, everything that needs to happen just flows, right? It just takes place. And yet, if it doesn't, there's something wrong. If, if he goes to kiss her and she gets repulsed and says, I just threw up in my mouth, there's something wrong, <laughs> right? You know, if, if you know, she wants to hold hands with him and he goes, it feels weird, and he just gets rid of her hand, there's something wrong. They're not captured by love. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to reading your Bible, to praying, to, to worshiping, to, to being in fellowship, to sharing your faith. These are all things that just happen because a person genuinely believes because they were captured by the love of God and now they believe upon God and he causes the works to flow. 
And now there's no confusion with the idea of faith and works. You're saved by grace through faith. But the works will always come if you truly believe. Listen, justification is that thing that God does for us first. God works on us, drawing us to himself, but then he works for us. And he does everything necessary for us to be saved. Colossians 2 verse 12 puts it this way. It says that if we're, if we're buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead, then you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That happens at justification. The bottom line is this, a court case is against you and all the evidence has been presented and it's a ton and you can't refute it. And so it's all written out as just a massive list of all the things that you've done. And if you can imagine that, all the things you've done, if they were listed, and how could you, you know, have a book that could contain all the things that you've done wrong? All those things and all the consequences of those things, it's over here. And there, here is Jesus, righteous. And we make a trade. I give you what I have and I receive what you have. That's justification. And God makes us right or just with God. So justification, it's God's work. We believe upon him for it as God works on us. And then of course, God works for us. Secondly, sanctification, verse 10. It goes on to say this, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Now, before we go on, you are saved by grace through faith. That's justification. But the same thing is true for sanctification, which is what happens after we believe. So justification, we have been saved. We've been made right with God. Sanctification, we are being saved. God's doing the work inside of us. And that sanctification process, some will call it cleansing or washing. The word literally means to be made holy. As God is doing that work of setting us apart for himself as a vessel of honor. So he works first in us and then he works through us. But he needs to do that work, work of working in us to mature us, to grow us, to equip us, to prepare us for the things that he calls us to do. Notice again, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, we know, of course, that we're made three parts. We've talked about that a couple times in the last few weeks. We were created body, soul, and spirit, so we're a trichotomy. Of course, when Adam sinned, the spirit died. Now we were simply body and soul. When we get saved, we're made alive again. So the spirit part of us that has been muted or dead is now made alive. That's salvation. Now we are operating the way God intended us to operate when we're saved, body, soul, and spirit. But listen, that's the justification work that he does in our lives. Now he sanctifies. In other words, he grows us up. He grows us up spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And this is what the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. In other words, it's his work. And why do I say that? Here's why. Because some people get the idea that I'm saved or justified by grace through faith, now, since I've been saved, get to work. And that's where people add religion to their Christianity. And that's a huge mistake. You see, the scripture speaks to that issue very, very clearly. Turn your Bibles over to Galatians chapter 3, please. Galatians chapter 3. Paul here is writing to the churches there in a region called Galatia. 
It's not just one church, it's a whole region. And as he's writing to these people, they have listened, some of them, to a group of people called the Judaizers. The Judaizers weren't so much opposed to the idea of somebody being saved by grace through faith, but they added to the law. So it was that you were saved by grace through faith, they accept that, but now you have to do all these works. And so these works really ultimately are what keeps you saved. Well, that's a false teaching. And so Paul is addressing that here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, and he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The idea is who has deceived or even possessed you? Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Before we go on, what he's saying here in verse 1 is, if we are saved by grace through faith, we recognize, Jesus, you've done everything necessary for me to be saved. You did it all. So when he said it is finished, it's finished. So if you're here this morning and you know that you are in sin, you know that you've been doing things where you're stuck in them and you can't stop doing it and there's no hope. You've tried to stop, but you can't. And you might say, I'm in a pit. All you need to know is this, is that you don't have to clean up your life or or get to a certain point and then call out to God. You call out to God where you are right now. And he can save to the uttermost. So it doesn't matter how bad you've been or where you are or how stuck you are, God can save you. And everything that needs to be done, he's already done. So when he said, it is finished, he meant it. It's finished. There's nothing else for you to do. You simply believe upon Jesus Christ, and you're saved. You ask him for forgiveness, and you're forgiven. That's it. What Paul is addressing right here in verse 1 is, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? What's obedience? Believe before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. You see, the person who accepts religion and says, well, I'm a sinner, I've blown it, I failed, and so now I need to do good works to offset the bad, is not obeying the truth. What they're saying literally is, what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary is not enough. What he did and what I do saves me. That's not true. That's not good news. That's bad news. Okay? The good news is he did everything necessary to be saved. And all you have to do is accept the fact that he did everything that's necessary to be saved, which means you no longer have to do anything to seal that salvation. It's not his work and your work together that saves you. It's his work. You believe upon that and you're saved. That's it. And what he's saying to them is, after you're saved, for you to think this way when it comes to your works puts you in a weird place. It makes you religious. But if you understand that you are saved or justified by grace through faith, then understand this, God who began the work in you is faithful to complete that work. What do you do after you've believed? You keep believing. I mean, even Journey got that. Don't stop believing, right? The problem is they went all heresy after that. Hold on to the feeling. Feelings don't weigh into this at all. The fact is what God has done for you and me on the cross at Calvary was sufficient. The fact is he rose again to prove it so. So believe. Fact and faith. Feelings can come and go. And feelings will come and go. But fact and and faith. And when you blow it, when you fail, when you do something dumb, you might not feel saved. You might feel beat up by guilt. Then don't go by feeling. Fact, he's done everything necessary to save you. Faith, I trust in him. Fact, after salvation, he does everything to keep you saved. Faith, believe him. Fact, He wants to do amazing things in your life. He wants to grow you up in Jesus. Faith. Believe him. Get out of the way. Let him do what he's going to do. So this whole sanctification process, it's something that happens by grace through faith, which is why he says, who has bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth before your eyes. Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. 
He's referencing himself in Romans 8 when he says, he who did not spare his own son, how will he not also through him freely give you all things, including make you mature, complete in Jesus. He is faithful to complete the work he began. Verse two goes on to say this, this only do I wanna learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, when you first got saved, did you receive the spirit by your works or by faith? Of course, it's by faith. Verse three, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, you are now being made perfect by the flesh? Okay. Guys, that would be like any of us being inside of a ring and getting our tail kicked by somebody. They're beating the snot out of us, right? And then you're able to reach over and tap Jesus in, okay? And Jesus comes in and just wipes the floor with your enemy. And then you're like, tap me, tap me, tap me, tap me. Why? You were just getting your butt kicked. You couldn't do anything before. What makes you think you're going to do anything now? We were hopeless outside of what Jesus did in freeing us from our sins and giving us the victory. And we are hopeless after salvation without him. We needed him at salvation and we need him all the way through. And so justification is his work, but also sanctification is his work. God works in us changing us, but he also works through us. And that's something that we need to get. God works through us. Vicki and I, from the very early on and one of our earliest dates, not our first date, maybe not our second, but certainly third, fourth, or fifth, we raced. Okay. We were driving by a park. We stopped, we were hanging out, talking, and she challenged me to a race. And thus began an ongoing race that has continued even as we've gotten older and older. And so we race in certain places. We've raced at parks. We've raced in parking lots. We raced at the airport. In fact, every airport we've ever been in together, we've raced, even with our bags. Okay? Vic almost always hits the little conveyor belt that moves people, which, by the way, has a name. Who knows the name of that? I had to look it up. Travelator. Just so you know, you're going to use that. Tuck that away in your pocket for later. Travelator. It actually has a name. It's called a Travelator. She always hits the Travelator, right? Which you think would work, right? Because it's going to make her go a little bit faster. The problem is there's always people on there that don't follow the rules to stay to the right. So then she's having to go like this, right? And so we race. Now, I've been on the Travelator. I've been on the Travelator going the normal way that normal people go. I've also raced against her going the opposite direction on the Travelator. Okay? Yeah? Guys, that's the frustrated Christian life. <laughs> Being on the travelator, trying to very hard to move against the flow, and if you stop, you go backwards. Honestly, 90 plus percent of all Christians live that way, frustrated, striving, trying, trying, trying to go against the flow, against the conveyor belt, and as soon as they stop, they lose ground. But the life that we live sanctified by God, as God's doing the work, is just being on the travelator And sometimes you're walking, and sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're standing, talking, and you keep moving forward. Because God's the one who's doing the work. We need to remember that. God does that work of justification. God does that work of sanctification. And lastly, God does that work of glorification. Verse 8, again, says, For by grace you have been saved, Through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What we need to remember is this. God works above us doing that work of preparing heaven. That's why Keith Green many, many years ago said this. God made all of creation in six days, but he's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. Think about that. Jesus said in John 14, verses 1 through 3, let your hearts not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Therefore, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back for you. That where I am, you may be also. And the way I go, you know. At which point Thomas asked a great question or said a great statement. Jesus, we have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) 
we don't know the way. And then Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But anyone who would, anyone who would call upon his name will be saved because there's room enough in heaven for every single one of us. And so if you don't know that you're going to heaven and you want to know, we want to give you an opportunity before we're done this morning to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, to look upon him and believe. And then watch him do what he does. He is the one that can restore our souls. He's the one that can save us. He's the one that can forgive us and make us a new creation. So God works above us, preparing all these things for us. But listen, God also works inside and outside of us at that day when we finally do go home to be with him. His work, justification. That's when he saved us. His work, sanctification. That's when he is saving us. His work is glorification. That's in the future. When we die, he will save us. And he'll make all things new. Amen? Amen. Everything. There'll be no more death, no more dying, no more tears, no more sorrow. For the former things have passed away. Behold, he says, I make all things new, right, for these words are true and faithful, meaning this, you can count on it. You don't just believe, you get expectancy. Get excited about what you've already believed in. Recognizing this, that the older you get, you get more excited. Somebody once said it to me when I was 19 years old. They were an older preacher, and he said, the older I get, the more excited I am about heaven, because the older I get, I know more people there than here. And there's truth to that. There certainly is truth to that. Job said, in all the days of my my hard service, meaning in his life, I will wait until my change comes. And meaning, I have expectancy. I'm waiting for the day when I get a new body. I'm waiting for the day when he makes all things new. I'm waiting for the day where everything I experience now that's a rehearsal or a foretaste, well, it pales in comparison to what I see there. I'm waiting for the end of my faith. Did you know that? There's a day that comes where faith is traded for sight. The end of our faith is our salvation. When we get there, we trade faith for sight because we're saved by grace through faith here. We're being saved by grace through faith, and one day we'll be saved by grace through faith. When I was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and I was working in the office, um, one of the guys that was with me, it was also interning. He said, um, if you have an opportunity to go to a funeral that Pastor Chuck leads, you should go because it's amazing. His faith in the Lord was evident. His joy was infectious. He had a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And of all the people I've ever met, I'd say that probably is the best way to describe him. He had a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ and you could see it. And so, I didn't get a chance to go to a funeral that he led, but that man did. And I asked him, well, how'd it go? You know, what what was so special about it? He said, it's hard to explain, but I just put it this way. I wished I was dead. (laughs) Because the way he described heaven was so uh, compelling. It was so so real. I I wanted to go right then, you know. And that's the mark of an amazing funeral, Right? when you're actually jealous of the guy in the box. Listen, I remember in one of our classes, him talking about one of his mentors. It was one of his professors when he was at Life Bible College. His name was Guy Duffield. And Guy Duffield had talked about his ministry, which had began back in the 20s. He had pastored for a long, long time. He said, when I was pastoring a local church, I went to a lot of potlucks. And I remember many times the person that planned the potluck that was organizing everything told us all, hold on to your fork after dinner because the best is yet to come. Speaking about the dessert. And the way he always described life was like the meal and heaven was like the dessert. And so he'd get a twinkle in his eye and smile and say, the best is yet to come. 
Well, Guy Duffield went home to be with the Lord in 1998. And when those came by to see his body lie in state, they saw his Bible in his right hand and a fork in his left. I love that. You see, Philippians 3 verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. You see, he who began a good work in you and in me as believers in Jesus Christ is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me finish with this. Billy Graham was getting old and he was losing some of his faculties and the people of Charlotte, North Carolina, viewed him as their favorite son. And so they wanted to honor him with a luncheon before he got too old to be able to attend. And so they reached out to him, asking him to come. And at first he was reticent, but eventually came. And he listened to the people that were leaders in the city, you know, talk about his life, his ministry, and how much of an impact he had on so many people for so long. Afterwards, they asked him to just share a brief remark to close, and this is what he shared. I'm reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist who once was traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, he reached in his vest pocket, but he couldn't find his ticket, so he reached into his trouser pockets. It wasn't there. He looked in his briefcase, but he still couldn't find it. Then he looked in the seat beside him, but it was gone. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, we all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle punching tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and he saw a very, very old Albert Einstein on his hands and knees looking under his seat for his ticket. The conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, please, please don't worry. I know who you are. It's no problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one, sir. Einstein looked at him perplexed and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going, and that's on the ticket. (laughs) Having said that, Billy Graham continued, do you see the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My children and my grandchildren told me I needed a new suit, so I went out and bought a new suit for this luncheon and for one more occasion. You know what occasion that is? This is the suit in which I'll be buried. But when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to immediately remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. Life without God is like an unsharpened pencil that has no point. May each of us have lived our lives so that when our ticket is punched, we don't have to worry about where we're going. It's well said. Would you stand with me?